This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. The museum and gift shop will be closing in five minutes. Thank you. We hope to see you again. It was around 3 a.m. on April 14, 1991, when a man quietly emerged from one of the bathrooms inside the Vincent van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. He'd been there since the front doors were locked hours earlier. As he entered the main hall and headed toward the security station, he pulled a ski mask over his head and removed the pistol from its holster. With the element of surprise on his side, he was able to quickly disarm the two guards that were on duty. Locking one of them in a storage closet, he forced the other to disarm the security system and unlock the front doors. An accomplice was waiting outside and immediately entered the building. Over the next 45 minutes, the pair collected 20 of Van Gogh's most famous works of art, stuffing them all into a couple of foldable garment bags. Using one of the security guard's vehicles, the robbers threw the bags in the back and took off. The plan was to rendezvous with another car at the train station, but when the other car got a flat tire and failed to show up, the thieves panicked and took off on foot. At just before 6 a.m., three hours after the heist began, Authorities located the getaway car at the train station. They couldn't believe it when they also located the two garment bags inside, still containing the 20 paintings valued in the hundreds of millions. It didn't take long before investigators arrested four Dutch nationals, including one of the security guards. If it had been successful, the 1991 Van Gogh Museum art heist would have gone down as one of the largest in modern history. Instead, it's remembered as one of the most short-lived attempts on record. In December 2002, the museum was robbed again. This time, thieves climbed up to the roof and used a sledgehammer to gain access. Within minutes, they had stolen two Van Gogh paintings, estimated to be worth around $100 million combined. Fourteen years later, in 2016, Italian police discovered the artwork during a raid on a mafia clan in Naples. It may have taken a while, but the paintings were finally returned, hopefully under better security this time. Since 1988, a total of 28 Van Gogh paintings have been stolen from museums across the Netherlands. What these robberies have in common is that every piece was eventually located and returned. Other famous works of art like the Mona Lisa, which was stolen by an employee of the Louvre in 1911, and Edvard Munch's The Scream, stolen in 2004, were both found two years after they were stolen. When it comes to recovering stolen paintings, however, these cases are a few of the exceptions. According to a recent report, the success rate of actually finding a piece that's been stolen is only 10%. The low odds of recovery have motivated some countries to create specialized police units dedicated to investigating art theft. Even with resources like this, it's still a good bet that a well-planned art heist will succeed. That is, of course, assuming the getaway car doesn't get a flat tire. A year before the largest art theft in modern history was thwarted by a flat tire, a team of robbers across the Atlantic in Massachusetts was working on a plan of their own. Their target was the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in downtown Boston, and in March 1990, they managed to pull off what is still considered the world's greatest art heist. Yet, it's not just the half a billion dollars in stolen artwork that makes this case stand out. It's about how they did it, and to this day, managed to avoid capture. My name is Eric Crosby. Welcome to True.
Isabella Stewart was born in April 1840 and grew up in New York City. Her family had made their fortune in the iron, coal, and textile industries and sent their daughter to private schools in both Manhattan and Paris. She focused her studies on art, dance, and music, and excelled at languages such as French and Italian. Isabella would often accompany her parents on trips around the world, immersing herself in the various cultures. It was on one of these trips that she and her family visited a small museum in Italy that made a lasting impression on the teenager. The museum housed a large collection of Renaissance artwork, but it was the way each room was designed that captured Isabella's attention. Unlike many of the grand spaces chosen to exhibit most fine art, this small museum felt much more intimate, as if being in someone's home. Each room was designed around the historical era of the works showcased within. They were filled with antiquities and sculptures, rugs, and tapestries. Isabella had never experienced art presented in such a personal way, and loved everything about it. She told a friend that if she ever had the money, that's exactly what she would do. When she finished her studies in Paris, the 18-year-old returned to New York City. Not long after, while visiting a friend in Boston, she met the man who would become her husband. 21-year-old Jack Gardner was the brother of her friend, and the two hit it off from the moment they were introduced. They shared a passion for the arts, travel, and foreign cultures. It didn't take long for the pair to get engaged. Jack's family was one of the wealthiest in the U.S., and their marriage a couple of years later was the talk of the social elite. The young couple settled in Boston and had a son. Sadly, he died just a couple of years later from pneumonia. Isabella became pregnant again a year later, but miscarried. The heartbreak was compounded when she was told that trying again would most likely kill her. This was a turning point for the couple, and on the advice of their doctor, they packed up and started traveling. In 1867, 27-year-old Isabella and her husband Jack headed for Europe. Over the next year, they traveled across Scandinavia and Russia, spending the rest of their time in France. When they returned to Boston, Isabella was feeling rejuvenated and began socializing again. This time, however, she was determined to establish herself as an influential socialite and patron of the arts. Several years later, the couple was off again, this time to the Middle East, Asia, and Central Europe. In total, their travels kept them overseas for 10 years, but in between, they always returned to Boston, often with newly acquired works of art. By the late 1890s, Isabella and Jack Gardner's collection had become world-renowned, not just for its famous paintings, but also for the vast catalog of original manuscripts, photographs, ceramics, and silver pieces, to name a few. The couple realized that while their house was more than adequate for them, it was not going to be enough to accommodate the rapidly growing collection. So, in 1896, Isabella and Jack made plans to build a museum to exhibit the impressive works, which included Rembrandt, Degas, and Manet. With that small museum in Italy still vivid in her mind, Isabella hired an architect to help realize her vision. The land was purchased in what was then a swampy part of Boston, and construction began. The structure was designed after a Venetian palace, with the four-story gallery surrounding a glass-covered courtyard. The architectural design was unique to North America, and the first of its kind in the U.S., Isabella poured herself into the project and was responsible for almost every aspect of the construction and interior design. Sadly, in 1898, Jack Gardner died, leaving Isabella to continue the project alone. By then, the couple had curated more than 2,500 works of art, more than enough to fill their beloved museum. Construction was completed in 1901, and two years later, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum officially opened to the public. Until her death in 1924, at the age of 84, Isabella continued adding to the collection she and Jack had started decades earlier. According to her will, the gallery's installation would never be changed. Nothing would be added and nothing would be removed. Her museum would be left exactly how she left it. But it wasn't just the art installation that hadn't been altered in decades. It was also the building itself. 
As the 1980s rolled in, the museum needed some work. There had never been a climate control system installed, several areas required maintenance, and a security system was basically non-existent, to list just a few issues. In fact, it wasn't until after the FBI became aware of a plan to rob the museum did the gallery do anything. Even then, compared to other art institutions, the security upgrades were entirely inadequate. Only four cameras were installed around the outside perimeter, but fearing it would be too expensive, the decision was made not to install any inside. Dozens of motion detectors were installed inside, but the only alarm connected to police was a manual button at the security desk. Instead of implementing so-called fail-safe procedures like other museums at the time, where guards would check in with police on an hourly basis, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum had no such measures in place. With such lapses in security, you would think they had a pretty sizable insurance policy to cover the valuables inside. Nope. The Board of Trustees decided that, too, would be too much of a financial burden to the already stretched budget. When the Director of Security proposed hiring guards with better qualifications, his request was rejected. Those decisions would soon prove disastrous, not just for the museum, but the entire art world. A former swimsuit model and naval officer create a body-positive ballet academy that ends up in a cold-blooded killing. A Brazilian supermom starts a cult-like family, adopting 37 children, and then she marries one of them. Then the children team up to brutally murder the husband, who's also the stepbrother? Wondery's new weekly series, Scamfluencers, tells the unbelievable true stories behind some of the world's most infamous scams. From Wondery, co-hosts Sarah Hagee and Sachi Cool unpack what drove these scammers to deceive others and how our culture allows them to thrive. You'll hear how these charismatic and captivating people executed their schemes, conning people out of their money and sometimes their lives. Each season, Scamfluencers will immerse you in the shocking tale of fraudsters, their victims, and what happens when the facade comes crashing down. Listen to Scamfluencers on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Spotify, or you can listen early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Geico asks, how would you love a chance to save some money on insurance? Well, of course you would. After all, who doesn't love a great deal, right? And when it comes to great rates on insurance for all the things in your life, GEICO can help. Like with insurance for your car, truck, motorcycle, boat, and RV. Even help with homeowners, condo, or renters coverage. You could save even more with a special discount when you bundle your coverages. Plus, the easy-to-use GEICO mobile app available 24-hour roadside assistance and more. And choosing to switch to GEICO becomes an easy choice. Switch today and see all the ways you can save with great rates and discounts. It's easy. Simply go to GEICO.com to get a rate quote. Or contact your local agent and get started seeing how much you could save. It was around 12.30 a.m. on March 18th, 1990 when St. Patrick's Day partiers started emerging from the downtown Boston pubs. With lots of police on patrol that night, it wasn't a surprise when some late-night revelers passed a couple of officers sitting in their car as they walked past the Gardner Museum. At the time, the group of slightly intoxicated students didn't notice that the officers were sitting in a small red hatchback, not a police car. They also didn't notice that both officers were wearing fake mustaches, The men were parked suspiciously close to the museum's side entrance, but the group assumed they were police officers and walked on by without giving it much thought. Inside the museum, 25-year-old Randy Heston and 23-year-old Rick Abbott were just starting their security shift. Neither had received formal security training, and both viewed the job as the most uneventful and boring thing they could think of. This was Randy Heston's first night shift since starting as a guard, so he remained at the main desk while Rick Abbott made the first patrol. It was policy that at least one guard stay at the security desk at all times to cover the only alarm directly connected to police. Their job was typically boring, 
which is exactly why they loved it. But every now and then, there was a little action. A couple of weeks earlier, for instance, the night guards heard banging on the side door. When they checked the video monitor, they saw a man being beaten up by a couple of other men. Over the intercom, the man asked to be let inside to escape the attack, but the guards kept the doors locked and notified authorities. After informing the man and his attackers that police were on the way, the guards watched in amazement as all three hopped into a nearby car and drove off. At around 12.45 a.m., as Rick Abbott continued his patrol of the museum's interior, a fire alarm began ringing on one of the upper floors. Checking it out, he determined that it was just a false alarm and started to make his way back to the security desk on the main floor. On the way, he stopped at the side entrance and quickly checked outside before closing the door again. Abbott returned to the desk where Randy Heston had been monitoring the systems. The pair switched, and Heston took off on his first patrol of the evening. Twenty minutes later, someone at the side entrance pushed the buzzer on the intercom. Abbott, who was still sitting at the main desk, received the call and checked the video monitor. He saw two policemen on the closed-circuit camera. Both wore typical Boston police uniforms and appeared to be carrying sidearms. Assuming it was related to the nearby St. Patrick's Day festivities, Abbott asked over the intercom what was going on. The officers explained they were responding to a disturbance call at the museum and had some questions. When they asked to be let inside, Abbott had little reason to suspect anything was out of the ordinary and at 1.24 a.m. opened the side door. Once inside, the men walked directly toward the security desk where Rick Abbott was sitting. Looking around, they asked if he was working alone or if there was anyone else in the building. Abbott told them his partner was making the rounds. They told him to radio Heston and have him return to the security station. As they waited, one of the officers asked Abbott if they had ever met before. When the officer suggested that he might look familiar because of an arrest warrant, the night watchman started to get nervous. He was asked to come out from behind the security desk and show ID to prove he wasn't the person on the warrant. Walking over to the uniformed men with his ID in hand, Abbott was happy to cooperate. The problem was, he had just left the museum's only panic button unmanned. As he got closer, Abbott became aware that the officer's mustaches looked fake. But by the time it registered, one of the men had thrown the security guard against the wall and handcuffed him. Not that he was an expert at getting arrested, but Abbott noticed that he had not been frisked, advised of his rights, or any of the basic procedures he would have expected from a real police officer. As this was happening, Randy Heston made his way back to the security desk and was immediately handcuffed as well. It was only after both guards were subdued that the officers explained that they were there to rob the place. Abbott and Heston were led to the basement where they were tied to a steam pipe and told not to make any trouble. To ensure the guards would remain quiet, a generous amount of duct tape was wrapped around their heads. Taking their wallets, the robbers read their addresses out loud, driving their point home. They also suggested that, if the men did keep their mouths shut, there might be some cash in it for them. Just over ten minutes had passed since the robbers were buzzed into the museum, and already they had overtaken the guards and disabled the security system. They now had the entire building to themselves, and uninterrupted access to some of the world's most valuable works of art. As if checking off a shopping list, the robbers spent the next hour curating their own collection from the walls of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Starting on the second floor, they selected three Rembrandts. When the proximity alerts began beeping, they simply smashed the devices and continued taking the art down. Using the marble floor to break the protective glass on each frame, they cut around the edges with a knife and removed the paintings. Before moving on, Two more paintings and a bronze artifact were added to the cart. As they moved to another area of the building, they picked up five works by Degas, a Manet, and a gold statue from the Napoleonic Wars. Satisfied with their loot, the two robbers returned to the security desk where they removed the video footage from the outside cameras as well as data from the infrared motion detectors. Before leaving, 
they checked on the two night guards to make sure they were still securely tied up in the basement. At 2.45 a.m., 81 minutes after entering the museum, the robbers exited the side door, loaded their car, and drove off with an estimated $500 million in stolen artwork. Two thieves dressed as Boston policemen broke into the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum early Sunday morning. The stolen artworks have been on display at the Gardner Museum since the turn of the century. The FBI is hoping to move quickly on the investigation before they're sold on the black market or hidden away indefinitely. In the morning, while most Bostonians were sleeping off a St. Patrick's Day hangover, the next set of guards arrived to start their shift. When no one was there to let them in, they called the museum's director of security, who arrived a short time later with keys. It didn't take very long to see that something was very wrong. With no sign of the night guards and clear evidence of a disturbance, they contacted police. When authorities arrived, they conducted a full search of the premises and found Abbott and Heston duct-taped and handcuffed in the basement. After being tied up for nearly seven hours, Thankfully, they were both safe. The terrifying ordeal was over, but the investigation was about to begin, and they would both become front and center. At 23 years old, trombone-playing, pot-smoking night watchman Rick Abbott was probably not the ideal witness, but to the FBI, he sure was an ideal suspect. Not only did he let the robbers inside the museum, but also was the one responsible for activating the alarm, which, of course, he did not. Suspicious, but given the police disguises and cover story used by the robbers to gain access, Abbott's excuse that he was simply tricked remains entirely plausible. It's probably the only reason he was never charged, despite being considered by the FBI early on as a person of interest. Eventually, however, authorities determined the two guards were far too inexperienced and incompetent to pull off the burglary. As the investigation continued, it became clear that whoever robbed the museum knew what they were doing. The FBI was unable to find a shred of physical evidence left behind at the crime scene. There were no hair or DNA samples found anywhere. With the security footage removed, authorities only had eyewitness descriptions to go on. One of the men was around 5'9", with a medium build. The other was around 6'1", with a slightly heavier build. Both were believed to be in their 30s. Even with artist sketches, in a city like Boston, with a population of over half a million people, that could be just about anyone. With little to follow, the case grew cold. In 2013, well over a decade after the robbery, the FBI announced that they had identified the art thieves. At least, they were pretty confident they knew who did it. According to the Bureau, the men were members of an organized crime family, had a history of burglary, and closely resembled the witness descriptions. The only problem was, both men had died less than a year after the robbery. One of an apparent overdose, and the other shot to death. Little more information was provided, and the bits that were seemed more and more confusing. Investigators admitted they were unsure where the art had gone, and in a desperate move, asked for the public's help in solving the case. We still have an investigation here, and we still have to preserve the, the integrity of the investigation. And because of that, we can't tell you everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I know it's, it's kind of a little tantalizing to kind of to put that out there and not be able to follow it up and say, this well, is who we think did it. It's gotten us to where we are right now. And basically, we need the help of the public. We've used it before, and it's been great. And we continue to try and solicit the help from the public. Over the years, the FBI conducted numerous raids on locations where they believed the art was being stored, but their efforts always turned up nothing. You see the federal agents, they're working under that canopy, a sort of command center they've set up right in the driveway. This is a mystery involving a reputed mobster, some missing masterpieces. Teams of law enforcement agents have swarmed the home of a reputed mobster. They're digging up the yard and removing evidence from inside... In 2015, the museum's art director, Ann Hawley, went beyond praying for the safe return of the art and contacted the Vatican. Desperate for divine intervention, 
she asked Pope John Paul II to issue a papal decree. Maybe she thought the mafia would feel guilty and give up if the appeal came from the church. It's been over 30 years since the robbery, with no sign of the artwork. So, no, it didn't work. And that wasn't the only time Anne Hawley had used unconventional means to retrieve the stolen items. Years earlier, in 1994, the museum director received a message from a person claiming to represent the robbers. The person claimed they had no idea who the thieves were and was just a third-party negotiator. The message went on to provide assurances that the artwork was being stored in safe conditions somewhere outside the U.S. The list of stipulations included immunity for all parties involved in the robbery, as well as over $2.5 million deposited to an offshore account. In an effort to establish credibility, the writer also provided details about the heist that only the FBI would have known. A coded message published in the Boston Globe newspaper would be the signal to the negotiator if the museum wanted to proceed with a deal. Confident the offer was legitimate, Anne Hawley contacted the FBI, and on May 1, 1994, the Boston Globe published the coded message. Later that week, Hawley received a follow-up letter at the museum. The person calling themselves the negotiator appeared to have a change of heart. They stated that there was concern authorities would not honor the deal and continue their search to uncover the identities of the people involved. The letter went on to say that the parties were considering their options and would need time to decide next steps. The anonymous negotiator was never heard from again. From being held in Ireland by the Irish Republican Army to hanging on the apartment walls of various gangsters, there's no shortage of theories about what happened to the stolen paintings. Who knows if they'll ever turn up again, or if we'll ever find out who the actual robbers were. To this day, no one has ever been arrested, and none of the 13 items has been recovered. In an effort to avoid a repeat of the 1990 event, the Gardner Museum has invested heavily in its security. Extensive background checks are performed on every guard they hire. Ongoing comprehensive training is required for all members of the security team. The four exterior cameras that made up the entire video surveillance system was given a much needed upgrade. The museum now has cameras of every size and capability throughout the premises. Night vision, thermal, low light, infrared, covert, dome, pan, tilt, zoom. Every square inch is covered. The Board of Trustees also finally decided to invest in theft insurance. A bit late, but good for them. In accordance with Isabella Stewart Gardner's wishes, the museum has never changed the arrangement of the installation. Where the stolen paintings once adorned the walls of the gallery, today the empty frames are all that remain. Never giving up hope that the items will be returned someday, the museum is offering a $10 million reward for any information leading to the safe recovery of all items. The amount is believed to be the largest cash reward ever offered by a private foundation. Incredibly, because the statute of limitations ended in 1995, the robbers, whoever they are, can no longer be charged with committing the greatest art heist of all time. We all want love, that happily ever after feeling of finding your soulmate. What if someone not only claimed they could help you find that perfect partner, they guaranteed it? Jeff and Shalia, a young couple famous on YouTube, teach about twin flames, a deep romantic connection with your perfect ultimate partner in their videos. It's a divine love. You're designed for no one else, and they're designed for no one else. But the path to finding your twin flame isn't so simple. Those who start to doubt the group are instructed to cut ties with friends and family that are holding them back and to corner and claim their twin flame through stalking and intimidation. By the time some members are able to leave the group, they don't even recognize themselves and the harassment to rejoin makes them fear for their safety. From Wondery, Twin Flames is a podcast about what happens when the quest for love turns into a dangerous obsession. Follow Twin Flames on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. This year's NBA playoffs are going to feature a lot of great rookies, and FanDuel wants you to be one of them. 
Make your debut on FanDuel Sportsbook with promo code ROOKIE, and your first bet is risk-free up to 1000 bucks. So you can bet the point spread, grab the money line, or build a same-game parlay. And if you make a rookie mistake, FanDuel will give you up to $1,000 back in site credit so you can take another shot. Okay, this guy's got potential. Make every moment more with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Sign up and unlock your risk-free first bet up to $1,000. We're looking forward to seeing what you're made of. 21 plus in President Virginia. First online real money wager only. Refund issued as non-withdrawable site credit that expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. is a production of Imperative Entertainment. This episode of True was researched by Haley Gray and written by me. The executive producer is Jason Hoke of Imperative Entertainment. The cover art and design were created by Jenna Sullivan. True was created and is produced by me. Have any comments or questions? Email us at podcasts at imperativeentertainment.com. As always, a huge thanks for listening. I'll be back next week with another episode.